We are live uh, December the 21st, 2023, just days away from 2024. We're live at the Utah Safety Council. Uh, we're in the corner of Classroom A, otherwise known as our computer lab, where we train about 13,000 people a year in uh, basic orientation plus and basic orient plus refresher, all the site specifics for the refineries, uh, good stuff happening here. Uh, we have our guests looking at me like uh, uh, we just need to invite them over. Roberto, come on over. Come on in. Yeah, come on in. We're recording live. Uh, we're very excited for Utah Safety Council speaking up for safety podcast. Yeah, come on in. Sponsored, uh, brought to us by the Labor Commission, who uh, uh, grants us a very generous grant uh, to help produce this show. Uh, produced by R. Brandon Long, my lifelong friend uh, from Ogden, O-Town, affectionately known as. Okay, we got everybody here and seated. So we're doing Speaking Up for Safety. Uh, we have a very uh, semi-nervous Utah Safety Council staff. Uh, this is going to be <laughs> led by uh, a Taylor Steed. We have a JP. We have a Fabian. We have Roberto. And remind me your name. Eduardo. Eduardo. I know I probably didn't say that right, but uh, <laughs> you're going to have <laughs> plenty of opportunities. I am John Wojcikowski. I'm the, uh, the president of the Utah Safety Council, which uh, means that I don't do anything is what Nicole tells me. <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we're very excited to be here. Uh, I'm going to turn the microphones over to uh, all the esteemed guests here, and uh, they're going to talk to us about uh, many different things. But, uh, you know, we're very excited to announce that, that we've been awarded a grant from the Labor Commission to help of our OSHA training, our safety training in Spanish. And so uh, we have uh, our friends that are going to help us with that. And uh, Taylor is going to lead. He and Quentin McCarver, actually who should be over here now that I think about it, uh, are going to lead up uh, that effort. And then uh, JP and Fabiana uh, speak very good Spanish. It's argumentative on who speaks the better Spanish, but we'll let those guys work it out. And so uh, with that, we can either sing the 12 Days of Christmas or jump right into it. Let's do it. Taylor, it's all you. All right, perfect. Quentin, come on down. Um, okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. Just to let everyone else know who I am, my name is Taylor Steed. I'm one of the occupational program managers here at the Utah Safety Council. Um, we'll just go ahead and get started then. Uh, we know that you know Spanish-speaking workers often face a disproportionate amount of injuries, of issues that might happen on the workplace. There could be barriers. Um, tell us a little bit first about uh, who you are, who you work for, and what you do, um, and then we'll jump right in and continue talking. Is that okay? Okay. My name is Roberto Gomez. Um, I work for Oakland Construction. I'm one of the risk and safety managers for Oakland Construction. Um, I've been in the industry for the past 17 years doing safety. I started my career on the oil field, uh, fracking, uh, drilling, and then I moved into construction. And I have been with Oakland for the past almost six years. Perfect. Mr. Eduardo. Yeah, yeah, go ahead and... Uh, Do it like this. Uh, there, you, there you And go. just uh, up a little bit. There you go. There you go. A little bit more. <coughs> I'm Eduardo Perez. I work with Lane Construction. I've been there for 24 years. I've been in construction for about the 30, last 30 plus years in different types of construction. With Lane Construction for 24 years, I work in the field. So I'm a regional safety manager for our company, Lane Construction. So I've been in the safety for about 18, 18 years. So that is, that is me. Perfect. And we can have our other Utah Safety Council people, if you can introduce yourself as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, so my name is Fabiana, and I've been working for uh, Utah Safety Council for the past, what is it, seven months, Quentin? I think we hired at the same time. It was it seven months or so since April. There we go. And April, May. Um, okay, there we go. And so, um, so I work in the accounting department uh, with JP. Um, and so, I'll give you the microphone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My name is Juan Pablo, and but I go as uh, JP. It's shorter and easier. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I've been with the Utah Safety Council for about five months now. And that's kind of the experience I have in safety. Although I worked for a construction company for about five years, so 
I probably have a lot of bad exam examples that happened during that time, but mm -hmm. I'm excited to participate here. Thank you. Okay. And Quentin. Well, uh, John introduced me as well as I think Taylor mentioned <laughs> earlier today, but um, Quentin McCarver, I'm the other occupational program manager. Um, like Fabiana said, I've been here since about May, so a few months now, coming close to our year, so i um, excited to be here. Perfect. Thank you. Um, if, if our guests could say, a li can you speak a little bit to why there might be a disproportionate amount of Spanish-speaking workers that might get injured on the job? Or what are some of the barriers that our Spanish-speaking workers face inside the, um, the workforce? From my experience, it's, um, we have been having a higher amount of people coming from other countries. They're not exposed to the occupational standards, habits, cultures, and uh, they came with other habits. I wouldn't say that it, they're necessarily bad, but they have other habits. And when they came to the States and they don't understand that they're not necessarily required to put themselves at risk and they try to do the work, that's when we start having a higher increase in number of incidents. And what we have been working together is to bring awareness, uh, bridge the gap on cultural lack and education, and help those migrating workers that are coming to the States to understand that we have standards, that we have organizations, that they have rights, that there's education, and that they don't have to put themselves at risk. And basically that's what we have seen and that we, what we're doing. Okay. I agree with Roberto, you know, the way I call it is they, <clears throat> they come with a different kind of chip in their head, you know, because this chip being introduced to them from some childhood, that's why they have different habits. And here in the United States, we have, we have different ships. We have rights, rights that maybe they, they didn't have before. So a lot of these issues is the lack of education, lack of education labor-wise, you know. And so that's why we're trying to help. That's one of the reasons for me that I, I decide to go into safety, to be able to help others uh, on their own language. One of the things that um, Roberto, Cesar, and I, we understand the language, we can speak, speak the language, but it's not just that, it's the culture. It's so different about that. We understand where they're coming from. So what we're trying to help here is trying to, to help them to change that ship. That they're in, they're in the United States, they're a different place. There, there's rights here and ed education. They can get education to be safe, to work safe. Perfect. Uh, would you say that in our countries, like I'm from Argentina. Yes. And to tell you the truth, I moved here when I was 18 years old. And so I don't know exactly how would the construction would work over there and stuff like that, like the regulations and policy. Would you say that in a Latin country it's just like less regulated? Like so they, it's not that they don't care, but it's just like, just go and do the work and that's it, it, it we're it not gonna offer the protection and stuff like it that. It is less regulated. And another thing, you get hurt and if you report the injury, you might lose your job. Mm -hmm. That's why that's why a lot of the Hispanics they're afraid to to report injuries because they think they're gonna get fired. This is where we we, we help them out to change that ship. Yeah, yeah, it's like the lack of regulation and those are one of the main things. So plus uh, there's a lot of corruption. Mm -hmm. And there's uh ways that employers can get away mm -hmm. without taking responsibility of the injured employee without paying penalties and replacing the employee. Right, mm. yeah. You're injured, you don't work for me anymore. Mm. Right. Who's next? And they come with that chip in their mind and they think that they need to act that way in the States and we are trying to change that by educating and helping. Right. And there's, there's uh, organizations like OSHA, we have OSHA here, they might have the same in, in the Latin America countries, but because of the corruption, that will favor the, the employer all the time. And, and the employees, they are being ignored. So, 
Perfect. And any hazards. That's great. And we'll talk a little bit more about OSHA stuff specifically in just a second. But actually, JP, you mentioned you worked for a construction company for about five years, right? Yes. Uh, tell us a little bit about that, actually, if you can, and kind of what were some of the problems with safety, maybe, or some of the issues that you faced? Um, sure. Um, so one of the things that I was thinking about as you guys were speaking was that I actually came with that chip even though I never worked construction back in Colombia, um, I was afraid of reporting injuries um, just because I was afraid that my job was, you know, at risk. Yeah, exactly. So, um, the the I mean, the company was great at training, right? They would they would have like a safety training meeting um, once a month, but it was on us, the workers, to abide by it and and actually um, do all the things that we were learning right but in the job side there are many many opportunities or many cases where I don't know I, I was working with windows so with glass uh, and you, then you will get caught and then you still had uh, a window opening right that you needed to finish and then you just I don't know clean it up a little bit well like blood you know so the conditions weren't great, but because you you wanted to finish the job, you will just ignore that injury and just never report and just kept going. So, it, it is interesting that our safety culture, occupational safety culture, that we came from our countries, it's not the same at the same level as this. And even though in the states you can see safety companies, construction companies, that they're not at the level that they should be safety-wise. Uh, so changing that safety culture, it's a process that will take time. And even though big companies like Layton Construction or Oakland Construction that we have been in business for a long time, you still see people with that old ship mentality that they haven't switched yet completely to the new safety culture that they're, and that's a constant battle that you have to be working and working and mentoring and teaching so they can start switching little by little. It could be either an old school guy or it could be someone that is coming from a different country that they don't have that, they, they have never been exposed to that safety culture. Mm. Mm. Um, do you mind if we kind of repeat some of what we mentioned, some of the big talking points, sure. but again in Spanish, just that way we can have any Spanish listeners kind of, uh, we'll go back a little bit if we can to talk about like the needs, kind of what you see inside the field. And then maybe if we can kind of rephrase some of the questions or some of the things that y'all said in Spanish as well, that'd be great. So no, <laughs> hey, that's it. I, I'm here. I'm here. You're, you're you're driving the ship. I'm just here to host it. So, but yeah, if that's we could do that, that'd be great. Um, so I'm not quite sure how to ask it, but. Bueno, entonces empiezo yo. Um, estamos acá con Roberto. Me dijiste Estuardo. Estuardo. Y trabajas en Oakland y Layton Construction. Construction. Um, y estamos acá hoy hablando prácticamente un poco de, de los derechos, eh, entre comillas, de, que tenemos nosotros los latinos en este país. Ah, y una de las cosas que estábamos ah, preguntando es, ah, están hablando ustedes de las regulaciones, que las personas de nosotros de Latinoamérica venimos de cierta manera eh, educados diferentes. Y ah, si nos pueden explicar un poquito ustedes cómo es eso eh, y cómo es el cambio eh, mencionaste en inglés eh, que venimos con un chip y que acá eh, de alguna manera nosotros seguimos trabajando de esa manera y no sabemos eh, nuestros derechos y por eso pasan los accidentes que pasan. Yo, yo soy de México, crecí en México, entonces yo, yo puedo relacionarme a la cultura de México, soy parte del norte, en el cual existen derechos pero no existen derechos. En el aspecto que alguien se accidenta, y reportas el incidente y, y eres despedido. Entonces, somos criados con un chip de no nos va a pasar nada, no tenemos que reportar nada. Si reportas, te vas, a vas a ser despedido. Entonces, las personas que emigran a Estados Unidos regresan con ese chip, vienen con ese chip. Entonces, es donde tenemos que empezar a cambiar ese chip. 
Una de las cosas, por ejemplo, mi padre tiene un taller de industrial. Y, y me acuerdo que uno, los empleados siempre recibían rebabas en los ojos. Y cuando yo estuve, aquí, cuando llegué aquí y empecé a tener entrenamiento sobre safety, les llevé safety glasses y les dije, pónganse safety glasses para que evitar que caigan rebabas. Solamente me vieron, Nada. se los pusieron y dijo, son incómodos, se los quitaron y preferirían tener rebabas una o dos veces al mes de en vez de usar los lentes. Wow. ¿Por qué? Porque no tenían ese chip. No, no existe esa educación, no existe ese... Um, Amor hacia la seguridad, porque nada más tienen miedo a, a no perder su trabajo. Tienen que hacer que el trabajo y la producción para que puedan seguir siendo contratados. Esa es la diferencia muy grande. Existen organizaciones como OSHA dentro de nuestros países, pero realmente por la corrupción solamente le favorece al empleado, al empleador, no al empleado. Claro. Y el empleado es ignorado. Entonces, Tristemente, no. tenemos que cambiar ese chip. Hablábamos también un poco acerca de la cultura de seguridad, cultura de seguridad laboral. Y precisamente, aunque existen los organismos que pueden legislar y poner leyes por la corrupción, es casi imposible. Es casi imposible hacer que se hagan cumplir esas leyes y se defiendan los derechos de los trabajadores. Así es que ellos tienen mejor la mentalidad de, olvídalo, quiero conservar mi trabajo, no digo nada. Claro. No quiero perder mi trabajo, no digo nada. Y por eso pasa lo que pasa, ¿no? Cuando venimos a este país y tenemos esa, esa poca educación uh, en seguridad uh, y nos pasan todos los accidentes. Eh, bueno, hoy vos contabas hace un ratito de cómo te cortabas, o sea, trabajando en, en construcción y eso, y quiz, quizás no decías nada. Entonces, ¿cómo pasan todos estos accidentes por no realmente tener esa educación que por ustedes miedo, hablan? El miedo. Tienen el miedo. Aparte, aparte de, la, de lo cultural del CHEP, como muchas de estas personas son inmigrantes, tienen el miedo que si reportan estos incidentes y van a la clínica, inmigración va a estar envuelto. E ese es el miedo que tienen. No saben también que como inmigrantes ellos tienen los mismos derechos. Entonces, es donde viene la educación y es por eso que el miedo a reportar. También existen, es triste decirlo, pero existen empleadores o patrones que les meten este miedo todavía, diciendo, si reportas, te voy a hablar en migración. Entonces, es por eso que no reportan. Y, y, y hace, falta, a, hace falta que todos conozcan sus derechos. Sí, así es. Yo estaba contando un poquito la experiencia que yo he tenido eh, del otro lado, de, 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 de la seguridad y era de que cuando trabajaba en construcción yo experimenté parte de ese miedo del cual estamos hablando, esa falta de educación o no sé si llamarlo ignorancia o qué sé yo, pero um, el hecho de, de continuar un trabajo cuando no estás apto para hacerlo por miedo a perder tu empleo definitivamente es algo real que se vive día a día en estos, um, en estos uh, construction sites, ¿cómo se dirá? En y desafortunadamente lo sigues viendo a pesar de que hay gente que ya son supervisores, uh -huh. pero aún no han cambiado su mentalidad, su, su microchip. Uh -huh. sí. el, el, los directores, los directores, los dueños de las compañías quieren cambiar la cultura de seguridad, uh -huh. pero los supervisores que se han convertido, que crecieron en otros pero, países, siguen tratando de impulsar uh -huh. esa misma cultura y hay que cambiarla todo el tiempo, hay que estar trabajando con ellos para para que reporten, para que hablen, para que defiendan sus derechos. Claro. Y, y la lengua es muy importante, e, e, enseñarles en, en la propia lengua y en la, en la propia cultura. Muchas de las veces hacemos una junta de seguridad o se hace una junta de seguridad o un entrenamiento de seguridad en inglés y lo único que vemos de todos es decir, yes, uh -huh. yes, pero no entienden. Entonces, es donde, es donde tenemos que ayudarlos a entender en su propio idioma. Estamos hablando sobre los hispanos, pero las personas de Asia es lo mismo, las personas de, del Pacífico, todos tienen que escucharlo en su lengua y aprender sobre, en, en su lengua lo que significa la seguridad laboral. Por lo menos conocer sus derechos y las sí. leyes en su propio lenguaje. Come here, César. Come here, César. César llegó. <laughs> Come here, Cesar. We'll share a mic with you. Out here in the chair of the 
<laughs> Welcome, Cesar. Hey, how are you? Muy bien, gracias. Good, good. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Do you mind introducing yourself for our, for our audience, please? Uh, sure. Uh, I'm Cesar Calvillo. I'm safety director for RNO Construction. Um, been safety for RNO for 23 years and been in the industry on occupational safety for 27. Um, Perfect. No, appreciate it. Uh, I was I actually have a question for you, Cesar. Um, what would you say um, specifically? Can you can you speak a little bit to uh, workers' rights specifically here inside the states? Whether or not individuals with uh, doesn't matter their legal status in this country or not, but could you speak a little bit toward that? Whether or not individuals who may be here and working on getting uh, citizenship or uh, green cards or whatever, uh, can you speak a little bit about kind of what the rights are, or at least do they have them? Just something along those lines. Yes. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, it was interesting. I was talking to with some. Um, uh, a worker that just arrived a couple months uh, months ago and and he got injured and he did not know what to do or where to, where to go he was planning to go take care by himself once i find out that it, it was a, an injury that happened at, at work it says it doesn't matter if you have like you mentioned um your documents to work here did you just arrive and you started uh a partnership has an employee and employer. That employer has the right for take care of that injury. And a lot of the workers that come, and they come from a country that um, sometimes they don't provide that workers calm or workers insurance. They think is the same as they arrive here. Um, the federal rights or the federal standard says that every employer uh, should have workers come to protect the employees. And every state, there's only a couple of states that have their own uh, workers come laws, like uh, Montana has a different laws. But here in the state of Utah, the Labor Commission um, has some uh, rights for employees and also for employers. Um, every employee that has a, that relationship with an employer um, has the right to receive any medical treatment if they get injured on, on their property or on their job site. Uh, the problem that we have is sometimes the employer doesn't provide the training, uh, safety orientation, where they provide this information, uh, provide a way to report injuries in order for them to get the information to go to a certain clinic and get the proper proper treatment. So training becomes a, uh, an important part of uh, any worker-employer or worker-employee-employer uh, relationship in order to them to receive the proper information and get their uh, tra uh, treatment when they get injured. The rights that the state of Utah provides, if the employer doesn't provide that um, right to receive uh, medical attention, a lot of the workers don't know that there's a labor commission that can help out. Uh, so part of our mission as a safety um, for any ethnic uh, people, Hispanic or Pacific or Asian, is to let people know that there's a labor commission, there's a, a right to receive training through our workers' comp insurance that every employee should have. So it's an important right that people should have uh, around safety and occupational. Perfect. And would you mind repeating some of the main messages of that, but in Spanish for any of our Spanish listeners as well? Claro, claro que sí. Me da mucho gusto para cualquier persona que esté escuchando esto que pueda aprender que cada trabajador que viene a los Estados Unidos tiene derechos no importa si tienen documentos o no, tienen derechos igual que cualquier otro trabajador y especialmente en cuanto al ambiente de seguridad ocupacional, donde si ellos se lastiman eh, dentro del trabajo, ellos tienen el derecho de reportarlo a su empleador y poder recibir atención médica. No tratar de ir y atenderse 
como lo hacemos en nuestros países con remedios que hemos aprendido de la abuela, de la tía, Pero de que... Está mal. No está mal el remedio de la abuela. Exacto, no, no, no tiene nada de, de malo los remedios y a veces son mejores que el, el señor que soba y todo. Entonces, las personas tratan de tratar de mejorar su condición de, de esa uh, lastimada como ellos pueden, sin saber que tienen acceso a una atención médica donde pueden tener unos rayos X para asegurarse si está una fractura. Tienen el derecho de recibir una resonancia magnética para ver que todos los músculos estén bien. Entonces, es importante que los empleadores tengan esa iniciativa de entrenar a los empleados de qué hacer cuando reciben una, o, o tienen un accidente en el trabajo. Uh, todos planeamos no accidentarnos, pero accidentes pasan y es mejor saber qué hacer cuando pasa de, de no saber y, y saber que no vamos a recibir la atención médica que tenemos que hacer. Entonces, um, es importante que los empleadores tomen una iniciativa de entrenar, dar la información y recibir la atención médica por medio de la compensación del trabajador. El estado de Utah tiene una ley que cada empleador debe proveer compensación al trabajador y cuando no lo hace, los empleados pueden ir y reportar a, a, la, a la comisión laboral de, de Utah para que ellos puedan ayudar a que el empleador tenga su responsabilidad como empleador y proveer ese derecho a los empleados, que es, es un punto importante para que ellos puedan continuar en el trabajo y puedan regresar a sus familias. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, anything else to add um, for what? I, I would like said. to add in Espanol and English. Um, both, <laughs> one or either. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Something that I was thinking while Cesar was talking about uh, is that sometimes we don't share that information or the companies don't share the information about how to report incidents and what the rights are. But some other times they do, but the employee is a yes employee is the one that they give you the yes, but they're not getting anything of the training that they're receiving. And even though the employer is doing the effort, none of the message is being understood. Mm -hmm. So it could be either or, that yes, they are not communicating, or yes, they are communicating. And that's when we think that it's important that we bridge that gap and we help them understand that it is okay, it is okay to report. There's nothing to be afraid. And in fact, if you report it, you will receive better care from your employer, from your rights, from the state, and they will make sure that you will regain all your strength and be healthy enough to come back to work. Perfect. Appreciate it. Any other things to no, add? I was ask, oh, sorry. <laughs> it's Spanish and English, right? So, mm -hmm. Spanglish. Mm -hmm. they, they're afraid to report. You know, an injury. An injury. What, what, what happened with an injury? You know, it's a consequence of our behavior. And when the injury happens, like I said, it's a cause of a behavior. If they're not trained, they have that bad behavior. So that's why we need to have that training, either in their language so they can be able to understand that. And we need to encourage them to report the injuries and they have the rights in, in any language. Right. Uh, not only in the language, but understanding the cultural background. What, depending on what country they're coming from, it's the level of corruption. Mm. Like and Colombians, like Colombians and Mexico, you know, we're together. No, but <laughs> 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 but uh, if you, that's great that we have many people here in Utah that speak the language. But understanding the culture brings us to a different level. Mm -hmm. Because you're not only able to help the employee, but also the employer to understand those gaps. And you will help them connect And, and I had I had an experience this week. I was I was in Mexico visiting some family, and my, I met a, an ins, uh, a a safety professional. And we were talking about this. Even in Mexico, there was a place where they having all these injuries, and it was an indigenous group. They didn't speak Spanish. Mm. 
they speak the Indian language. So that af after so many incidents, they figure it out that they have to be trained in the indigenous, in the indigenous language. Now imagine if those groups, they come here, it will be harder for us now because if they don't speak Spanish, we don't, we don't speak the indigenous language. So th that's why we need to know our employees. We need to know where they're coming from. Like Roberto says, their culture. We need to learn and know about their culture. I like what you say about that, like not only understanding the language, but understanding the culture. Um, so I work, I was part of this construction company for seven years, and uh, it was so hard for me to, when we have employees that were new to the country, and they were like, you know, different different countries in like Latinos country. And so um, we got so many accidents. And so um, I remember like doing all this OSHA uh, training and stuff like that. And, um, but it was hard for, for me to make them understand that they can report these accidents, you know, and these uh, injuries and stuff like that. It was so hard and I was like, I promise you, Nothing's gonna happen. Like we can go. I can help you with whenever you know whatever we need to. And it was so hard for them to. They were afraid because they're scared. They they, they think, are scared. They yes. think immigration is gonna be involved. Exactly, they're, they're scared. Yes. The other thing too is maybe someone got hurt and they report it, and whoever the supervisor was, maybe they threaten them and says you're gonna get reported, deported, mm. and that's and then they talk between them and that's what they're afraid to. To report those injuries you know this is where we start needs to start changing that ship mm -hmm. so through a lot of a lot of training a lot of talking to them so they we have they have to gain our trust and not only that they also have to see that management it's committed yes too mm -hmm. because if if it's only the safety guy talking that you have the rights you have the rights but they see the superintendent training uh the employee for reporting an accident and now you're making my project to to look bad, <laughs> mm. they're getting the wrong message. But when they see the whole management team committed to not only quality or production, but also safety, that makes a difference. Absolutely. In fact, here at the Safety Council, we've been working with, I won't name any specific company names, but we have a company who they want all of their foremen who speak Spanish to get OSHA 10 construction certified. And that's a great opportunity for them to actually get some of that training, to start breaking down some of that stigma of, hey, this is these are some of your rights that you have under OSHA, under work for workers' comp, under all sorts of other federal laws and regulations, even state laws and regulations, to help our workers, regardless of their ability to speak English or regardless of their immigration status. Uh, you know, we at the Utah Safety Council have received that grant, like John mentioned earlier in the beginning of the show, uh, to help with more OSHA 10 construction Spanish classes. Um, can you guys tell me a little bit as to why that kind of training is important, specifically with some of the content that's in those classes? One of the things that I like to mention when I get invited to teach a class like that is to value the effort, not only in time, but investment that the company is making to bring all those people and sit for 10 hours to receive that training. That talks about the safety culture that that employer is working on their own organization. Not every company, not every construction company is willing to invest the time, the effort, and the money to train their people. So I'll make sure that every time I get invited to teach a class, value what they are doing for yes. you. They care about you. Take advantage of this class. Now, some of the topics that we talk, it could be many different topics. It could be fault protection. It could be chemical protection. It could be many different ones. But what I enjoy the most when I'm teaching, it's seeing the face of them realizing like, oh, that's why I was coughing so bad. Or, oh, I, that's why I was suffering. I didn't know that I, that I supposed to be protecting myself this way. I love to do that. I, I love to see that face and that change in that realization of, oh, okay, now I know how can I protect myself. One of the other things, you know, we can teach all these standards to them and they will understand it. But there's something that we're lacking to, you know, we start putting a lot into the OSHA trainings is leadership training. Because a lot of these people, they just told them, you're the foreman. But there's no foreman training. They don't know how to be a leader. 
and a good, uh, how to be a good leader. And when they become a good leader, they will be able to, to listen up and speak up. They will be able to understand the culture. They will be able to understand the employee. And we, we, are, we are in a process or not in a process, but we have production and they push us into production, you know, and, and the foreman is responsible, the frontline supervisor. But without a leadership training, you know, they can accomplish it, but if we have leadership training, we will be able to help out, help the employee to become a better person, to be help them on the safety side, to on the production side, on the, on the quality side. So yeah, we can help, yeah. we can help them with their budget, their schedule, their quality, their production, their safety. Instead of only focusing on getting it done, concrete is going to be a here tree. Get it done. So when we do OSHA training, we put part of that for, we talk for a little bit about leadership. How is to be a good leader? Yeah, it's not great. just checking those boxes. No, checking of, we box. went over this subject, that's good enough. No, it's it sounds like it's more to me um, from what you guys it, have been it's describing. It's like an example, you're saying these companies requesting all their foremen to have that 10-hour, uh, 30-hour OSHA. Great, but they need to invest a little bit more into the leadership so they can be able to be good leaders to be able to listen up and to be able to speak up. And then eventually become just like you three, you know, being Be their better. own leaders Be or better superman. or better, Be you know, better superintendent. Exactly. Better More exactly. like Cesar. More like Cesar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cesar, do you have anything else to add for this? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I hear a lot of the time that companies that they're employing uh, Hispanic workers and they can explode Pacific Islanders or um, Asian Asians. Um, I travel for, for my company to Las Vegas where there's a lot of Hispanic community and there's a lot of workforce. Utah is becoming, having more than probably Las Vegas. Nevada requires every construction worker to receive an OSHA 10 hour class. Every supervisor to require an OSHA 30 class. And that's been over almost 15 years. What we're seeing is that a lot of the employers they want to have that OSHA training card, and they think that they're done. There's no more training to be done. OSHA 10-hour classes and OSHA 30-hour classes, they're only intro introductory to the OSHA standards. If a company deals with scaffolding or they work with uh, uh, fall protection, they work at heights, we probably might touch one hour, an hour and a half for fall protection. But the employer think, oh, they're trained. I don't have to worry no more. So when a company is committed, oh, I want to do OSHA 10 hours, they're just scraping the ice of the iceberg that the training is needed, but OSHA 10 hours is not enough. And sometimes the employees are learning the commitment that is required by employees to wear the PPE, to recognize the hazards, and do something about it. But the employer has a responsibility to provide the PPE. Yeah, I need to get in work up there, but they're making by my own harness. Mm -hmm. They're making go get my own respirator. My own That's the commitment that the employer needs to have. So it's, it's uh, from all this wave of employers, employees that they're coming, employers need to understand that it's kind of almost a double sword. I'm going to train them, but then they're going to know their rights, and then they're going to start asking me for providing, making do my rights that the employer needs to, needs to do. So it's not just the, the training. It's... It's another chip for employers, too, that if I want to make this successful and be a long-term, I need to change my mind that I need to start showing that I care by providing the tools in order for them to do their job safely. Not just, okay, I'm going to do training. You're good for the next five years. No, there's more and more training. If they're working on, uh, on serious hazardous exposures like uh, fall protection issues or they're cutting concrete where they're going to get exposed to silica, there's more training than 30 minutes of an OSHA 10-hour class. And they just need to recognize that, oh, I might need a six-hour class just for fall protection or a four-hour class just for scaffolding because they spend eight hours on a scaffold uh, working for the scope of work that they're doing. So 10 hours is just an introduction. That's and a great it, basics. A basics. Yeah. It's, just, it's just the basics. And sometimes employers want to use that 10-hour because they got trained for everything. <laughs> and, and, and it's not... <laughs> Yeah. Is there any of our other safety council people have anything to add? Any other questions that you have for our guests about what we've talked about so far? 
uh, well, I, n I don't have a question. I just want to say something like uh, we we're talking, for example, about fall protection. And, and we do offer here like once a month. Like, I think you came to the fall protection, didn't you? Yeah, and did a great uh, job. And, you know, like, and those are free and people can, like, log in online. Like, and just, like, do it in your home. Like, and they all just come here and present and just take those and keep continuing the education, right? Which is a good thing. I think it's a... A great thing that we offer here. Yeah, we offer those classes specifically not just for us to meet a certain standard, but to help others to advance their own careers, really, and to help mm -hmm. them maintain their safety. Because that's ultimately what we're here to do, right? We're here to help people be safe, return to their families, and to live happy, healthy lives, right? Um I mean, that's something that I think employers are starting to recognize a little bit more and more, hopefully now, is that if you value your employees, you'll maintain not only, you know, you'll make, you'll make money, which is, gr which is good, uh, but you'll also have healthier people who want to work with you, who want to grow and to lead inside their companies. Um, Can go I ahead. say something? Uh, Stormer was talking about um, the needing of leadership training. Mm -hmm. In my experience, I have seen two types of Hispanic people in the workplace. The ones who grew up here in the States and they're fully bilingual, but they haven't experienced the culture of their parents. And the ones that came from their countries, they grew up in their countries and they have all the experience and the knowledge and they're probably the best leaders for their crews, but they don't speak the language. Yeah. But the kid who grew up here in the States, who is fully bilingual, He's lacking on experience and knowledge, but he can communicate with the crew. And sometimes they are the ones who get pulled to be the supervisor of the crew. And they're lacking on experience and knowledge. And the experience and knowledge employees they get upset because they choose the, the, the kid. And, and that conflict creates uh, a lack of success on quality, on production, on safety. So leadership, that's a great uh, th that's something that the Hispanic working frontline needs to bring those unexperienced to the level that they need to be and to help these other ones that they don't speak the language to be able to manage and direct crews yeah. based on their experience. And, and not just Hispanic, but it's everywhere. Yeah, We need because they tell you, Cesar, you're my new foreman. Here's, here's the paperwork, okay? But what type of training do they have of leadership? So that, that will be good training to, for people to have, to companies to have, to become leaders, to be great leaders. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Actually, I have a question for Quentin, actually, if he could actually take a moment. Um, Quentin, uh, you and I inside the occupational program here, you know, we've encountered many individuals from diverse backgrounds here. What does it feel like when someone comes in and you and I don't really speak Spanish? and we try and help out our folk who come in as best as possible. Have there been experiences that we have had here where we really don't know how to help someone and it feels, how does it make you feel? Well, I mean, yeah, that, that's an option that I sometimes feel like we fall back onto, but we do have two great Spanish speakers here, but when they're not here, it's definitely difficult. Um, it's, it's a hard one to do because not understanding someone is, you know, basic communication, you're not, not even be able to do that is, is pretty difficult to get, especially for safety training, to get those two people to understand. It, it's definitely difficult. So um, I do have a question, though, for you guys were talking about the, you know, leadership training. Do you, do you have any suggestions on what kind of topics or what kind of things need to be in that leadership training? I don't know if I'm do dodging your question. No, no, but, you're, that's fine. Um, I, I'm very curious about that. Like, what kind of input and what kind of structure would you need behind a like a leadership course or something like that to teach people who want to be leaders who are or who are forced or voluntold to become leaders, like some sort of course or something to learn or what they need to know to be a better leader in their role. For my opinion, how to manage people, paperwork, and technology. Mm. And how to listen? How to listen and how to speak up. How to listen too, you know, and how to speak up, because that that is great. They need to be able to sometimes take a pause and listen to the employee. We might hear things that we might not like, 
but we need to be in their food, in, in their, in, to feel what they're feeling too, you know, to be able to understand. That, those are the types of leadership we're talking about. Because mm -hmm. people will come and talk to you and you're like, okay, just go, go back to work. They don't feel lessened. So, and the same with speak up. I think those are the things that they'll be part of a leadership training. So how to talk to people and how to listen. Because sometimes, because they're the ones who were pulled out of the crew to be the leader, they believe that they can talk to them as the leader the same way that when they used to be on the same crew. And that lack of respect, that creates conflict. Mm -hmm. So not only leadership and understanding paperwork and technology and, and know how to talk to them and how to listen to them, but also how to conduct a meeting. The, the, the other thing too is, how. the other thing too, you know, uh, me and him, we work together. I might be the foreman, but we become really good friends because we spend eight hours of the day together. But he makes an infraction or something stupid as safety wise. I won't say, I won't say nothing because he's my friend. I don't, I don't want him to, his family to be hurt financially, so I won't say anything. You know, th those are part of the leaderships we're talking about. I remember that ethical, correct? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I remember when I became a foreman at one time, I, everybody was my friend in that crew, and I have to tell them, be, inside these fans, I'm your foreman. Outside these fans, I'm your friend. Mm -hmm. So we have to learn to separate that. And, and that comes into leadership training. You know, how can we separate those? So we have to still make sure our friends go home safely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, let's listen, let's listen from Cesar, <laughs> from the wise man. <laughs> and then if we, if we could also uh, just speak more about the leadership um, aspect also in Spanish as well, I think that'd be really good for our um, Spanish-speaking okay. listeners. <laughs> 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 I do the Spanish version of it. Actually, in the OSHA 30 is where we have more time to spend almost two to three hours on safety leadership. Uh, NCCR came with a, a training program that teach communication, how to listen, listen skills, and how to address when a hazard has an exposure to an employee, but also conflict resolution, how to address an issue when you're going to I remember starting my career, you know, 27-year-old, telling a 55-year-old superintendent that he's doing something wrong. How he's going to take it, listening from a younger uh, supervisor, um, it, it's hard. And he might get upset. The superintendent might come and say, well, you're slowing down my most productive employee. So conflict resolution as a, as a leadership as a, or a safety le uh, leadership is it's important that not to be afraid to say something when something's wrong. Um, matter of fact, I, this, this morning I had to do a post-incident evaluation where they knew that this vehicle shouldn't be parked there, but nobody said something. Two hours later, it got struck by a piece of equipment. When we're reviewing, how can we prevent this from happening? Well, if I would have said to move, but I was afraid that he was gonna get mad, he was gonna be here for 20 minutes. An hour later, he was working, he was not aware of where the truck was, and he got struck, the, the vehicle. Nobody got injured, but it, it could be possibly somebody be there with the, with the vehicle. So uh, leadership needs to learn that when they see something, not just any safety leader, anybody, in any project or any company, that if something's wrong, you need to say something with the fear of uh, reper uh, repercussions of what happened from the employer. They just, they just show that they care for the per people working next to them. So it's important that people know that, that, that uh, anybody can stop the work when it's, it's dangerous. If you care, speak up. Speak up, exactly. Entonces, mm -hmm. si a alguien lo ponen de supervisor, de líder de un grupo de personas, es importante saber y aprender uh, estilos de dirigir a una persona, aprender cómo comunicarse, a cómo escuchar a la persona y cómo uh, reprender a una persona, aunque sea un amigo, cuando la persona está haciendo algo indebido que puede causar una, uh, un accidente para sí mismo o para las otras personas. Entonces es importante aprender, no nomás que le den el radio, ahora tú eres encargado, 
y tienes que hacer y esperar que esa persona de repente aprenda todas las uh, cosas que se necesitan para poder ser un buen líder, ¿verdad? de poder eh, esperar que todas las personas hagan todo lo que se han enseñado, pero que lo hagan cuando nadie los está viendo. Que ellos puedan reconocer qué hacer con el conocimiento que recibieron para cuando tengan que tomar la decisión, puedan tomar la mejor decisión para prevenir ese accidente. Entonces, liderismo en el trabajo es importante para poder prevenir accidentes y saber cómo, cómo hacerlo. Me gusta mucho lo que vos dijiste eh, en cuanto a, a comunicarlo, a saber comunicarlo también. Porque siento, o sea, se me vino la pregunta es, ¿cuán importante es tener este tipo de entrenamientos en nuestro propio lengua? ¿Me entendés? Porque sí, podemos, eh, hoy hablamos más temprano que decían, eh, si sos eh, el yes employee, que estás todo el tiempo como diciendo que sí, que sí, cuando no lo entendés. Entonces pienso como que se me viene esa pregunta, ¿qué importancia te, le tenemos que dar a ofrecer este tipo de entrenamientos y entrenar a nuestros empleados en nuestra propia lengua? Porque siento que eso ayudaría un montón, eh, no solamente en el liderazgo, sino en nuestro, saber cómo protegernos y cómo proteger nuestro equipo. Los mejores entrenamientos se dan cuando la gente participa, comparte sus experiencias y sus aprendizajes. Pero cuando no se sienten a gustos de hablar, cuando no saben cómo expresar y se lo callan, se vuelve un, un entrenamiento monótono donde el entrenador es el que habla y los demás callan. Claro. ¿Pensás que pasa mucho eso en, nuestro, en nuestra comunidad? Que a veces no, 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 no nos expresamos. O sea, en ese sentido de decir, oh, me pasó algo, pero no, está bien, no es tanto quilombo, o sea, no es tanto problema, ¿cómo le decimos? Sí. No es tanto problema. Entonces vamos a dejarlo así porque está bien, vaya a saber qué va a decir nuestro jefe o nuestro supervisor o lo que fuera. Entonces, ¿piensan ustedes que están más en este fío que pasa mucho eso de que no, incluso en nuestro idioma no nos expresamos? E ese es el chip que tenemos cua cua en nuestra cultura. No, no nos enseñan sobre nuestras emociones. Entonces, tenemos, tenemos miedo de expresar nuestras emociones. El miedo de emoción tener, el miedo de tener dolor, tener cu cualquier emoción. Entonces, ese es el chip que tenemos que cambiar para que nosotros podamos estar expresándonos. Como dice Roberto, cuando hay una clase que hay mucha interacción, podemos ver que podemos aprender. Pero, pero viene es donde viene lo cultural. Y, y lo importante es cambiar el chip. Y no estoy hablando solamente del chip de seguridad, pero emocional también. Porque claro. venimos de nuestros países donde no se habla sobre la emoción. Uh -huh. si, uno, si uno va a una terapia, si uno va a un psicólogo, estamos locos. Uh -huh. Y no es así. E es para darnos herramientas para mejor, mejorar nuestra vida. Hasta que empezamos a cambiar ese chip, lo vemos de esa manera. No estamos locos, pero queremos ser mejores seres humanos. Claro, sí. Hablamos un poquito también, y después te paso el micrófono, <risa> pero lo veo callado igual. Eh, hablamos un poquito también del entrenamiento este que es OSHA y cuán básico es, ¿no es cierto? Porque a veces, eh, por, lo, por lo menos yo cuando trabajaba en, en este tiempo en construcción, yo pensaba como, bueno, OSHA te dan un poquito de todo, pero más o menos tenés una idea y como que hay la remas, como decimos en mi país. Eh, y ahora estoy aprendiendo un montón, o sea, con ustedes, e incluso acá en, en Utah Safety Council, donde es mucho más que todo eso. Ah, ¿Ustedes nos pueden explicar un poquito qué es, qué es OSHA, digamos, y qué es lo básico que se enseña y cómo podemos seguir educándonos en los diferentes aspectos que OSHA requiere? Obviamente sabemos que la Administración de Salud y Seguridad Ocupacional es una entidad federativa, es del gobierno, emite leyes y enforza las leyes. Sabemos que existe, uh, en los temas de OSHA 10, de OSHA 30, son solamente para mostrar los básicos. Pero hay clases donde son más extensivas. Si en una clase de OSHA 30 horas hablamos dos horas de protección contra caídas, nosotros podemos tomar una clase donde podemos hablar una semana completa de protección contra caídas. Entonces, comparación de dos horas con una semana, hay un abismo de información que nosotros no conocemos y que la gente que está expuesta a ese riesgo en particular podría aprender muchísimo más en una semana. 
Ahora, es muy común que cuando vamos a nuestras compañías con nuestros equipos de trabajo y les damos un entrenamiento y te dicen, oh, otra vez vamos a hablar de protección contra caídas, la repetición hace la diferencia. El hecho de que te estemos recordando cómo se selecciona el equipo, cómo se inspecciona el equipo, cómo se coloca el equipo, cómo se cuida el equipo, hace una gran diferencia cuando están allá afuera tomando decisiones arriba de la pared a 40 pies de altura, ahí es donde hace la diferencia. La repetición constante, que por lo menos una vez al año hablemos de ese tema y no solamente consideremos de que ah, ya tomó su OSHA 10 hace 10 años, ya, ya todo el conocimiento lo tiene, no es así. Otra de las cosas, este, algunos empleados se les ha dicho que OSHA es el enemigo porque vienen y dan, dan multas y paran el trabajo. Es al contrario, fue creado para proteger al empleado. Al, al empleado. Entonces, cuando les enseñamos eso, y, y, y ese es donde viene la comunicación y la enseñanza y educación, de que está para proteger al empleado, es donde se empieza a cambiar ese chip. Pero el miedo que tienen es, o oh, vienen a darnos multas, o, pero no, eh, eh, vienen a proteger al empleado. Claro. So. Sí, así es. Uh, algo que quería mencionar yo era lo que creo que Roberto mm, dijo hace unos minutos, de que nosotros como empleados tenemos que valorar los esfuerzos del de empleador que está haciendo para, para entrenarnos, para capacitar a, a los empleados en estos temas. Pero yo les quería preguntar, eh, ¿es requerido por el Estado um, que estas empresas entrenen a los empleados? O por ejemplo, ¿quién decide que se tiene que tomar la clase o chaten o 20 o 30? ¿Quién toma estas decisiones? <risa> Unos, unos niños um, de por aquí que <risa> se meten a pedir dulce. Una, una de los requerimientos de OSHA es que si tú vas a exponer a un empleado a, un, a una caída, Ajá. lo tienes que entrenar. Si le vas a dar un equipo de protección personal, lo tienes que entrenar. Si va a manejar una maquinaria, lo tienes que entrenar. Entonces, es requerido, tienes que hacerlo. Y no nada más es entrenar y te doy la bendición y ya estás listo. No, es tener un registro, es tener un registro formal de que pasaste por ese entrenamiento y qué temas cubriste para que el entrenamiento sea válido. Y es responsabilidad de los dos, o sea, tanto del empleador como el empleado. El empleador está poniendo su tiempo y su dinero. El empleado tenemos que, que, que poner nuestro deseo y, y, y hacerlo, y hacer cumplir también las reglas. Es, es la, la seguridad es la responsabilidad individual. Claro. Perfecto. Uh, we're going to wrap up a little bit uh, since we're heading at about an hour. Uh, so I appreciate your time. Uh, if there is something that you'd like to mention uh, that we haven't been able to mention before in regards to the topic at hand, uh, do you have any other comments that you'd like to make, any other things that you want to shout out? We at the Utah Safety Council are planning on providing more OSHA 10 construction Spanish-speaking classes during this upcoming year due to that grant. Um, and we love to have Cesar um, Estuardo. Estuardo, thank you. Uh, and Roberto, we'd love to have each and every one of you help us in that mission as well. Is there anything else that you'd like to say to our audience before we sign off? We just want to, we just want to say thank you, thank you to Utah Safety Council for what you guys do. You always put trainings together to to help us to be better, either to the employer or to the employee, company wise, safety wise. So thank you very much for all your efforts and for everything that you do for the community and for for. Uh, everybody here in, in, in the state of Utah. So, muchas gracias al, al Utah Safety Council por, por el gran esfuerzo que hacen para poner, ten, tener entrenamientos para mejorarnos como empleados, ayudar al empleado y al empleador a, a mejorar sobre la seguridad laboral. It is interesting to see that the Labor Commission and your organization um, are working to have these trainings more available. Um, a couple months ago, um, we saw the need, and we started networking in between all the Hispanic safety professionals of Utah, and we started talking about the need. And uh, in business, we are competitors, but out here, we're friends. Yeah. I mean, Layton Construction, r, &R Construction, Oakland Construction, 
we're friends and we identified that need. And we started networking a couple months ago and we were asking each other, hey, how do you do this? How do you address this problem? Do you have a copy of this training? How, how do you present it to your employees? And it's nice to see that you guys and the Labor Commission and OSHA and you guys are receiving grants because we're on the same page. When we start networking together and we start forming this Hispanic, uh, the, the, safe, the Hispanic Safety Professionals of Utah, it was originally because we were trying to help each other. First, to address the need to reduce the amount of incidents among Hispanic workers. Then we start helping each other grow professionally. How do you get this certification? How can I prepare? Help me out. What courses do you take? And then we start reaching out to other organizations and say, well, we want to help. How can we help? And it's interesting to see that you guys are making the same effort that we started a couple months ago, and now we're meeting together into this great effort. Perfect. I guess the, the Utah Safety Council will be a place where there's no competition. Um, we all three do or the need um, safety orientations for new hires, for example. Um, there's a lot of companies that there are 30 or 40 employees and below us the number of employees that they don't do those orientations. They just hire the guy because they need it. And when they come to our jobs, the orientation that the general contractor is doing is the first time that they're listening about safety rules. That they need to put a hard hat, <laughs> that they need to have this vest. And the employer just, just send it out. Um, as we speak, I just got that idea, a moment, that I know that Utah Safety Council helps the uh, refinery industry around Utah, and you guys do weekly or monthly classes or orientation. It would be nice for those employers in the construction industry, uh, either English or Spanish, that they don't have a safety person, that Utah Safety Council can provide a monthly safety orientation. It's a basic two-hour safety orientation that every employer, hey, I don't have that, but I can send it to, to Utah Safety Council and receive, and I get documentation, and somebody, oh yeah, I send them to Utah Safety Council to receive an orientation. Be on top of the OSHA tents, and OSHA tents receive a new hire safety orientation, and we can help with the, with the Hispanics, but also we can help because employers with non-Hispanic uh, employees they also lack, and there's still injuries that happen to them, but they can benefit from a, a new hire orientation. They'd rather go hire a consultant. Safety, safety Council can provide that, that help, similar to what refineries you do for the refineries. But we can start something like that, 24, and see that 2024, that a small employer has an access to a, a new hire safety orientation without going to uh, Layton or Oakland because I'm meeting for them, but but they can say, you know, I have a new hire orientation. Doesn't matter that Safety Council is doing, the employee is receiving the information. That's what is the purpose, is that the employees receive an initial training that is not the first time when they get to the job and they get to the roof, oh, I need to have three points of contact on that ladder. Mm -hmm. a and, and they need to know that before they get to a job site, and sometimes they're not. They're, they're receiving this orientation from the GC for the first time. And I don't know if you have noticed, but lately there has been a lot of immigrant workers that are coming because the employers can't get enough hands, mm -hmm. and they're bringing people with visas and work permits. And, and we have been involved with some of them doing orientations, and they have not a single clue of what is safety in construction. And that's scary because they're going to big projects to, to work in state and federals and, and, and get into job sites that are going to be dangerous. And they have no clue because they just got here yesterday from the border. And they came with a visa and a permit, and they don't receive anything. So it would be great if you guys can put some, something together like a, a new orientation onboarding program, a generic that, and if, even if it's in Spanish and in English, 
it will be great. So luckily enough, I can speak just a little quickly about that. When it comes to refinery sites, we at the Utah Safety Council are adopting what are called safety essentials from the uh, Health and Safety Council uh, in both English and in Spanish. Mm -hmm. So, and a lot of the refinery sites around here are actually going to be accepting that as a, you know, a requirement before going on to refinery sites. So we're already in the process of doing that when it comes to refinery sites. Nice. And that's a great thing because at the Utah Safety Council, it's difficult to provide a lot of those refinery trainings at least in Spanish since we don't have someone who speaks Spanish. We just don't have that availability. We don't have the means for that. But with this new safety essentials training that we'll be offering here in 2024, especially that's when we're really going to be hitting that hard. So there already is uh, work being done in that. We just got to get those OSHAs. We got to get the rest of the safety trainings that we can offer here at the safety council in um, different languages um, and, and, you know, in our occupational safety essentials class that we hold as well, uh, where, you know, you can come and you can learn uh, more about what it takes to make a safety program. You can learn more about, you know, from professionals, uh, how to, you know, be safe on the workplace, how to, you know, do basic things such as PPE, such as fall protection, such as, you know, reporting. And it'd be great to work on something where we maybe have someone teach occupational safety essentials, just like everything you've said, but in Spanish. And that would be something that we would love to coordinate with you, with you three um, at some point to see maybe we can do that. Maybe, and you're here to help. And that's the point. We are all here to help each other. We all have the same goals. And I think that as we go forward, that it's going to be a bright future ahead of us. It will. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invite. Thank you.